The title for our discussion, our study time today together is Peace in the Storm. We're going to talk about peace in the storm and uh, we are going to look at a number of Bible examples of storms and how we can have peace in the storm. Uh, it's pretty obvious and relevant uh, with what is going on around us today in the world that uh, there is a storm going on, a storm uh, on all kinds of levels. Uh, there is, there is a, a battle really, a, a raging battle. We already know about the battle called the Great Controversy that's been raging for a, a long time, but uh, it's, it's becoming more intense. We are seeing evidence, we are seeing signs that uh, things are heating up, they're ramping up. Uh, we're in the midst of a raging storm around us in the world. If you look at the news, and my purpose is not to focus on that, but to, to recognize that it exists and the effect that it has on people. Uh, this storm is threatening uh, to even get worse with all kinds of uh, issues, uh, restrictions, uh, fears. There is a storm of panic. There is a storm of, uh, of fear. Uh, anxiety that is uh, gripping people, uh, all kinds of fears. I don't, I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, try and go through a list here. But if if you watch the news, if if you see people on the street, if you, if you talk with people, you realize something, something's going on. It is really a storm. Uh, it's a storm also of of a health crisis. Uh, some people call it a pandemic. Others call it a pandemic. Whatever it might be, there is a storm going on. And it has an impact on us. And this is what I want to focus on today, because we want to talk about peace in the storm. We're not, we don't want to focus on the storm. We want to recognize and acknowledge that there is a storm. But what we want to focus on is the peace that we can have and must have and not lose in the midst of the storm. Uh, there are people who feel exposed in this storm uh, because it confronts us on a variety of levels on, on all kinds of different uh, in all kinds of different ways this storm is confronting to us to you personally today it might be very confronting in a particular circumstance that uh, personally touches you many people feel unprepared for the storm like they have been caught by surprise many people are seeking shelter in this storm understandably so uh, so today we want to talk specifically like i said about peace in the storm. And this is not just in the current storm that is going on around us. Uh, of course, that is very relevant. But I want to address it to any and every storm that meets us. If you are facing uh, a personal storm in your experience today, in your journey right now, whatever it might be, you're going through a, a, a troubling, dark time. This message is, is particularly designed for that, so we can have this peace in the storm. Uh, People are, are facing all kinds of issues personally. People are facing the prospect of losing their job, losing their income because of mandates, because of requirements, because of coercion that is coming in, requiring them to do things that they do not feel uh, comfortable with. Whatever it might be, whatever the circumstances, people are feeling uh, like they are losing heart, uh, being assailed with trouble. People are losing loved ones whether through loss of life or through estrangement, because they think so differently about some of the things that are going on today. And there's all kinds of storms I and mean, you know I'm, I'm giving some scenarios here all kinds of storms yours will fit in somewhere in this picture uh, that's that are going on and uh, today i want to look at what we can learn from the scriptures in light of that there's a story that uh, should immediately come to mind uh, relating to a group of people who were caught in a literal storm that's of course the disciples when they were with, with jesus in the boat they were caught in a storm let's read this passage together we'll make some observations and see what lessons we can draw from it and Luke chapter 8 records this particular story. And here is what Luke says, uh, beginning with verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship, that is Jesus. He went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. Verse 24. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Here is this famous account. Famous because it is recorded by three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this particular incident uh, with, with, with a few details, but uh, that 
differ slightly, not differ as in contradict, but they say something the other one didn't say. And you get a picture when you read all three, a uh, uh, wholesome picture. But I want to make some observations here because in this circumstance, the, the experience of the disciples has so many parallels for us today. We find ourselves caught in a storm by surprise and we begin to fear. We begin to uh, wonder. We begin to doubt. We begin to panic. And the, the, uh, the description here that the water was raging, the boat was filled with water. If you read the, you know, what Matthew says and, and Mark, they basically tell you the, the waves covered the ship. It was full of water. They were essentially sinking. And Jesus was right there with them in the boat. And it's like they momentarily lost sight of him. They got so uh, focused on the storm and what was going on and, and they were going to perish. And in a panic, they suddenly realized, oh, we better go call Jesus. And they called Jesus in this, in this fear saying, you know, Lord, we perish. Now, I want us to draw so many parallels from this particular account for what we face today. Now, before we go on, I want to read the, the other account from Matthew and just fill in a few more details for this story. And then we will... Uh, We'll make these parallels. And here is uh, this account uh, also in Matthew and chapter uh, 8, verses 23 to 27. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Here now is this parallel description from Matthew. Uh, it, was, it was a great storm. And here we see the, the words that Jesus rebuked the storm. Where this is why I wanted to read this particular uh, account. Uh, he told the disciples something before he rebuked the winds and the waves. He told the disciples, why are ye fearful, fearful, O ye of little faith? Jesus made a comment about the condition of heart that they had. The storm had so frazzled them, it had so uh, uh, troubled them, that they were fearful. And in that fear, they lost faith. He says, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And then says he rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. Uh, he didn't actually say what... Uh, it doesn't say here what he said to the wind and the sea. It was Mark, actually, who records that. Uh, but in Mark, it says he rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Peace, be still. And there was a sudden calm. But the words of Jesus now here to his disciples are very significant and very interesting. Now, let's, uh, let's remember that this really applies to us in so many ways. Like I said, we are currently going through a storm. This was their storm, but we have our own storm now. And for many people, like the disciples, they feel like they're, they're barely uh, holding on, battling the elements, battling the situation that surrounds them. And it's almost like they have forgotten that Jesus is in the boat, kind of like the disciples. And Jesus, to them, almost seems asleep, not responsive, not answering. And, and they're going to perish on their own. And, and as the disciples went to Jesus with this cry of, of anguish and, and, Lord, we're going to perish. Like, don't you care for us? The other, the other account says, and we're going to look, the, look at that as well. Uh, this is reflective many times of some of the attitude we might feel during a storm. If you're like, Lord, where are you? Uh, I'm not hearing an answer clearly. I'm not seeing a direction. This storm seems to overwhelm me. I am sinking. I am drowning. Lord, don't you care for me? I'm perishing over here. Here's how these disciples express that. And I find that their expression here is so very telling. This is their cry to Jesus. See if you can uh, relate to what they're saying. In Matthew, they expressed it this way, Lord, save us, we perish. Mark records it as, Master, care us thou not that we perish. And Luke, as we read, Master, Master, we perish. Here is this anguished cry. And I find it interesting, the element here, of course, perishing is, is consistent in all of them. They said the same thing. They're all recording, you know, different words of saying the same thing. It's the same thought conveyed. But you can sense the, the anguish, you can sense the anxiety, the panic in their voice. Lord, don't you care that we are dying over here and you, you are missing in action? We, we can't perceive your, your, your interest, your, your help, your support. You're asleep. You're fast asleep and you're letting us perish. If you have felt like that, you know uh, you can relate to, to the disciples. Uh, because a few things happened for the disciples to end up in this particular condition. I want you to remember the details of the story. We covered that already uh, earlier, but Jesus had actually told the, told the disciples, let us cross over 
to the other side. They forgot that. Jesus had actually given them the end result of their journey, the destination. We're crossing over to the other side. The storm that happened in between uh, seemed to be uh, hindering or interrupting that progress. The disciples thought they will perish. They did not think they were going to make it to the other side, even though Jesus had said we're making it to the other side. Brothers and sisters, in like manner, Jesus has told us how this circumstance ends. Jesus basically told us, I will be with you and we will go to the other side of the storm. We will pass through this time of trouble, this trial, this end of the world, and we know what the outcome on the other side is. We know what will happen. But it seems that as we go through the storm, like the disciples, we lose sight or we forget the words and the promise of Jesus. And we get so caught up in the storm and it overwhelms us and we feel like sinking. Say, Lord, where are you? Don't you care that we are going to perish? The disciples did just that. So point one, remember here, the words, the promise of Jesus. The other thing is Jesus actually fell asleep. He was with them in the, in the boat, but he wasn't doing anything with them. He actually fell asleep. He was tired. He was preaching all day and he fell asleep, resting, trusting in his father. I want to contrast, I want to contrast the attitude of Jesus and the disciples. They were both in the storm. One group were panicking and, and freaking out and losing all hope. They thought they were going to perish. Jesus was resting, sleeping. Calmly, he wasn't perturbed. When he was woke, when, when he was woken up, he didn't panic or fear. He told them, "Why did you fear, or you of little faith?" In contrast to, "I am not afraid. I am trusting in my Father, no matter what." And then he rebuked the sea and the waves, and he said, "Peace, be still." Now, the interesting thing as well, I want to mention about the rebuke of Jesus. Uh, we think of the word rebuke many times as as uh, telling someone off, or you know, uh, a condemnation of some kind, or rebuke, you know. Uh, but the way that Jesus rebuked the sea is he said, peace, be still. That was the, the, the contrasting attitude and command of Jesus. There was trouble, turmoil, the sea and the storm and the waves and the tempest. Jesus rebuked that by saying, peace, be still. Remember how God rebukes. That's an interesting point to remember here. Jesus' rebuke is to speak peace with power, with authority, with God's power. And he said, peace, be still. And that's what happened. It resulted in peace and the, the storm just absolutely disappeared. Now, if you look a little closer at the story, you, you recognize that there were elements operating behind the storm. You know, uh, the enemy was actually wanting to destroy the life of Christ. Satan was wanting to destroy this, uh, the life of Christ through the sudden storm and, and cause it to sink. You know, it was, it was an attempt on the life of Christ. Uh, Christ recognized what was going on. He was in his father's hand. He didn't panic. He knew that there was uh, other factors at play behind the scenes, and he rebuked the wind, the storm, and the storm disappeared. So much so that the disciples were absolutely shocked. So remember, Jesus told us how the story ends. Jesus is with us in the boat. He has not abandoned us, even though it might feel like he is not responding as we would like at the moment. Even though we get so caught up with the storm and anxious about what's going on and what will happen to us and we feel like we're about to perish, Jesus is right there. He has not abandoned us in this journey. Uh, this, this point is so simple and yet so foundational and so vital because brothers and sisters we are going through this trouble this storm right now i know people personally right now who are facing some of these prospects prospects that we're talking about losing livelihood losing a job losing an income wondering how they're going to provide for their family what are they going to do the prospects seem very bleak and and dark and it's like we're in a storm a very dark storm jesus has not left us alone in this storm he actually told us we're crossing over we're going on the other side. He didn't say, I will meet you on the other side. I hope you make it. No, he is in the boat with the disciples. He is with us through this. Now we keep going because these, uh, these storm and tempests uh, that are occurring now, I want to ask you the question in light of what we're talking about. And the question is this, how are you doing in light of the circumstances that are happening around us? How are you? Uh, how's your attitude? And particularly, how is your faith? Are you fearful? Are you panicked? Are you questioning? Are you doubting your preparedness? Uh, you're trying to work hard, trying to roll hard, you know, with the sails and, and the disciples doing everything, empty the, 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 uh, the water out of the ship and do everything they can. And it's like by happy chance, somebody remembers Jesus is with us. Where is, where is Jesus? He's asleep, asleep in this. Go call him quickly. We're dying over here. What is your attitude? Fear, panic, trepidation? Because I know, and I think uh, we, we recognize uh, what's going on, uh, that there are other elements at play behind the scenes, that the situation we're facing in the world today is more sinister uh, based on what the scriptures reveals to us. 
And what might seem uh, uh, at the front of it, what, uh, what we hear, uh, there is more behind the scenes, uh, basically. Uh, there are blowing winds in this storm that we're facing of mandates, uh, blowing uh, winds of restrictions and loss of freedom, illness, and even loss of life. The outlook, like I said, seems bleak. And to many people, it seems like Jesus is asleep. Jesus cannot be seen. And you might feel like you're sinking. I want to encourage you today, brothers and sisters, peace in the storm. How are you faring? How are you doing? Uh, look, uh, we have to acknowledge that the more you uh, fill your mind and your vision and your, your thinking with what's going on in the world, the more it will impact you because we are changed by beholding. You behold the storm and you keep looking at the storm. All of a sudden, you'll find that you are responding to the storm like the disciples responded. But if you recognize that, okay, the storm is happening, but I also need to look at where I can have peace in the storm. This is what I want to focus on today. So remember the words of Jesus. We are crossing over to the other side. Don't lose faith. Yes, there is some chop in the waters. Yes, there's some trouble along the way in the journey, but that's not the end of the story. We know how the story ends. Keep the peace of Jesus in the midst of the storm. Like he did, he trusted fully in his father. Uh, I want to emphasize this point that we're talking about here. I'll leave the story for a minute, but I'll look at another similar experience of others, other men of faith uh, in the scriptures, particularly as recorded in, in the Psalms. Now, the interesting, interesting thing about the, the Psalms here, and it's the, same, it's the same lesson, the same principle, and you find it time and again, uh, you know, uh, scattered in the scriptures. One of these things I noticed uh, when, I was, when I was younger, you know, these little pocket Bibles they have of the New Testament. And uh, these New Testament Bibles, Many times at the end of them, they would also have included the Psalms. Now, I always thought, well, that's a bit strange because the Psalms is in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Why do they put the Psalms? And the Psalms are a fairly big book. You know, it's, it's, it's the largest book in the Bible, has the most, most chapters. Uh, and they want to make a pocket book of the New Testament. Why put a, such a big book? And I, I, I never really understood for a long time why they put the Psalms there. I, I gathered that it must be, you know, important. Maybe it's a favorite for a lot of people. And it certainly is. And there is a reason for that. The reason for that is the Psalms actually record in song the experience of God's people. It's not just David who wrote the Psalms. A number of other people contributed to the writing of the Psalms, primarily David, of course, but not only him. And in the Psalms, you have a record of, of the songs of praise uh, and thanksgiving and also the experience of trouble and trial that they faced. And the interesting thing is that you will find that in the Psalms, it covers most of the range of human emotion and feeling, all the ups and downs of human emotion that we go through and experience through different circumstances, anger, uh, fear, anxiety, doubt, uh, uh, struggling with faithlessness, uh, uh, joy, happiness, praising God, whatever the experience and emotion, it is almost guaranteed to be found contained in one song or one psalm recorded, or more than one, of course, uh, recorded there in this 150 150, uh, you know, chapter hymn book of, of the faithful, and particularly the experience of God's people. God's people go through all kinds of experiences, up and down, and this is why so many people uh, have this, this connection, this, this love for, this, for the Psalms, because they speak to them, particularly when they go through an experience that they find a particular Psalm that really stands out, that they can relate to in that, in that way, because the Psalms doesn't really deal much with theology, and teaching and instruction, it actually primarily deals with experience, the feelings, the emotions, the experience that the, the, the author of the psalm wrote and he conveyed and, and what he went through. And it has the ups and downs and all these experiences. And so no wonder then that the book of Psalms is included with the pocket book editions of the New Testament. Uh, it makes sense to me now. I understood now what I didn't understand when I was, uh, when I was a young child. And many Psalms are actually about storms. You know, we're talking about storms today, peace in the storm. Uh, many Psalms deal with storms, the storms and the trials that people faced, but especially how they passed through them and were successful in overcoming them and maintaining or obtaining the peace through the storm, which is what the disciples who would have and should have been familiar with the Psalms. Not only that, but they had Jesus with them in the boat. The disciples should have recollected or had, had some thought uh, of that, but they didn't. And they lost the peace in the storm. And Jesus was there not to rebuke them, uh, you know, to condemn them, but to encourage them. 
The rebuke of Jesus was as an encouragement to them, to them saying, why, why were you afraid? Look at your heart. Look at your, condi your condition. I am with you right here in the boat. And, and we are on this divine mission. You, you believe I'm the son of God. Why did you fear? What happened to your faith? Where is your faith? In like manner. We might be like the disciples, you know, believers. We know the Psalms. Yes, we know the Bible. But we go through a storm. It's like all of that stuff just evaporates, vanishes from our mind. And we start to think, oh, no, what's going on, Lord? And we feel forsaken. We feel alone. And it's like, Lord, we're, we're perishing. Don't you care that I am perishing? So if you felt like that, my message today to you is not to condemn you. It's not to say, you shouldn't feel like that. Shame on you. That's not the point. The disciples of Jesus felt like that. What did Jesus say? Listen, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Why did you fear, O ye of little faith? Why are you allowing yourself to fall prey to the storm and forget the greater truth and reality that I am with you in it? That's Jesus. Okay, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Jesus here, uh, expressing that. Uh, have you forgotten the, this experience that Jesus with the disciples in the storm? Have you forgotten the experience of other faithful men recorded time and again in the scriptures and the Psalms? So today I want to remind you so that we can all have this peace through the storm. Because I tell you what, honestly, I watch some of the news sometimes and it gets overwhelming and I start feeling the absence of peace because I can see the waves and the billows and the tsunami, forget waves, the tsunami of waves approaching as far as all these things that are being planned for us. And so that's why I'm so thankful on the Sabbath, you know, I don't have news, I don't have anything. I'm looking at God's beautiful, wonderful creation and nature. The sun is shining and I'm remembering indeed that the creator and maker of heaven and earth is our loving father. And that's a reminder I want to share with you because it encourages me. I want to encourage you because brothers and sisters, we are all in this boat together, not alone, with Jesus. So I want to look at a couple of uh, aspects of this experience from the Psalms. One particular Psalm I want to focus on, we'll focus on two and I'll pick some highlights. The first one is Psalm 77. Psalm 77 is a Psalm of Asaph. Asaph is one of the authors, singers, he was a prophet and he's a singer and he's an author of some of the Psalms. Uh, I'll just pick some highlights here from his experience. And notice how Asaph went through a storm. You can relate possibly to what Asaph is going through. Here it is, verse two from Psalm 77. He says, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something you can, you can relate to? He was in trouble. He was facing a storm. Now, SF does not really specify or tell us exactly what is the trouble he was facing or what was the storm, but he tells us of his experience. He tells us of its effect on him. He tells us how he felt. And I put it to you that so many people in the words of this psalm can actually relate to, what's, uh, to the words of the psalm in light of what is going around them today, now, what they're facing. On a daily matter, people are finding out uh, news or information that all of a sudden their life is, is going to be directly impacted by some mandate or some law or some restriction that is being passed. And it is troubling. And of course, we are considering, Lord, we're seeing fulfillment of prophecy, but we're praying. We're praying for God to lead and guide. And sometimes we feel, like Asaph is saying here, that uh, we're remembering God, but uh, we're wondering. He seems silent. He seems asleep, like Jesus sleeping in the boat. He doesn't seem to be actively involved in the way that we expect him with what's going on in the storm. And we want to stand up and silence the storm or make it go away. And we're not seeing that. And it's troubling. And this is the trouble that Asaph was experiencing. He says he was troubled. He complained. His spirit was overwhelmed. If this is how you feel today, if this is how we feel in light of what's going on, this psalm is for you. This message is for you and for me. Now, now he goes on. What else, what, what else does he say? Uh, continuing with this experience. We'll drop down a little later. Uh, verse 7 down to 9. In the same psalm, he continues. He says, will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Now, this is interesting because you look at these verses, you think, well, that's strange talk for a believer, uh, an author of the scriptures. Uh, it, what, is, what is this doubtful you know, uh, expression? We did like God forgot about him. This is a struggle. This is a trial that a man of God was going through. So here's the thing we can learn from that as well, brothers and sisters. If you are dealing with this temptation, this, that's not a strange thing. If you're feeling the, the temptation of doubt and wondering what's going on, others, believers, authors of the scriptures have felt that. Here's a man expressing it. Jesus knows that we go through experiences and trials and troubles that attack directly our faith. And sometimes we don't hold up as we should. 
And he knows that it's a struggle. The disciples felt that way in the boat. They felt, Lord, we're forsaken. You got, don't you even care about us, Jesus? When they said, Lord, care us, not that we perish. It's like, Lord, have you, don't you care? We're dying over here. And it's like you don't care about us. That's exactly how this man, Asaf, felt. So if you felt that way, uh, and if you experience, if you experience that, maybe you haven't expressed it. Maybe you haven't uttered it to anyone because you think, whoa, this, uh, I can't talk like that. I can't express that as a Christian. That would be wrong. You know, people would would, uh, would rebuke me and, and I can't, but you felt it. You've experienced it in your mind. You're asking these questions in your mind. This Psalm is for you. This Psalm is for me. Because brothers and sisters, guess what? When we go through a storm, there will be that temptation, very real temptation. We'll feel like we're, we're alone. We'll feel we're alone because God is not acting in a way that we want or we expect at the time. And this is what makes it very difficult and very trying. And here is Asaf experiencing that. And in his experience, he cries out with these strange questions, these strange questionings. Uh, is God no more favorable? Did God forget about me? Am I, I feel all alone. Now, remember, this is written as an encouragement for us. So if you felt that way and you've experienced that temptation, you need to acknowledge that that exists. That's a reality. But here's the thing. Don't stay there. There is peace in the storm. How, here is how Asaf progressed from this particular you know, experience. We just keep reading a little later uh, in the psalm, uh, going down. I'm just picking some highlights. Uh, further down in verse 11, he says, I will remember the works of the Lord. So he dealt with the struggle. This is how he's feeling. And, and how, is he going to, uh, how is he going to deal with it? He's, he begins to remember something because he was forgetting something, obviously. So he's, he's reminding himself. And notice this experience that he's writing is, is relating in a song of praise, an experience of going through a storm, doubt, faith, uh, you know, uh, losing faith, doubt, questioning God. And he relays this uh, emotion, this experience, this question. And then he says, this is how I found a way out. This is how I found peace in the storm. This is the point of the song. And so verse 11 says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Now, of course, you're familiar with verse 13 here. It's quoted so many times. And it's used in all kinds of creative ways, I must say. But the context of the passage shows us the, the point of the verse. The verse actually says, when it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, it actually means, Thy way, O God, is in holiness. Okay, that's actually what it means, contextually. That's the accurate and proper meaning of the verse. Uh, uh, I know it's used in all kinds of different ways, like I said, but the context makes it very clear. What's the point here? He's simply saying this. He lost sight of God for a moment. He was so troubled, he was so overwhelmed. You might, you might feel like that way, losing sight of God. And look, you know the theology. You know you shouldn't think that way. You, you know the teaching, and people say, look, you should pray, just don't think that way. But it's still... It still is. You, you sometimes even can't can't pray. You feel like your prayers are not going, going as far uh, as the ceiling even. What happened to this man? He doesn't say he prayed. Something happened in his mind first before he even prayed. He, he Something came to mind. He recollected or he remembered. What he remembered was he remembered the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. He looked back at what God had done before, and he remembered that. And when he remembered that, something happened in his mind and began to change. And that doubt, that questioning that he's forsaken all alone, started to take a different turn in his mind because he remembered something. And this is the thing. The storm and the trouble and the trial causes us to forget. We don't see clearly. We don't see clearly what happened in the past. We don't see clearly in the immediate. And it, it blinds our eyes from seeing clearly what the future holds, the promise of Jesus that we will cross over. And, and we're blinded. And we're blinded. And it's like all we can see is darkness and doubt and, and anxiety and fear and panic. And we just lose faith and we say, God, where are you? What's going on? And then we feel bad because we're questioning God. We feel bad because we know we're not supposed to feel this way. So it gets even worse. And in our mind, we have this, this mental anguish and turmoil. Guess what? Asaph experienced this. The writer of this psalm experienced this. And this is the way out for him. So experiencing that and going through that, that's not a sin. That's a temptation. That's a trial. Here is how we can overcome that trial. That's the point here. Jesus didn't tell the disciples, get out of the boat. Forget it. Go land. Forget it. You're no longer my disciples. I'm going to go find some other ones. How, how can you be afraid like this? He didn't say this. His rebuke to them was not a rejection and a condemnation. It was an encouragement not to be afraid. It's like when I asked Adam, where are you? He's asking the disciples, why did you fear? Where are you? Where are you in your mindset? Have you forgotten that I'm with you? Why are you expressing so little faith? I'm right here. Look, I'll calm the storm for you. No problem. Don't worry. Don't forget that. Remember that. 
That's what, what Asaf remembered. And so he meditates on God's works. He talks of his doings. Not only does he think, now he expresses them. He talks of them. He talks of them in the psalm. He talks of them to others. In expressing what he remembers, it's now a positive experience. Rather than doubt and fear and, and questioning and feeling abandoned by God, he remembers. And what he remembers, he gives expression to. And in giving expression to what he remembers, it strengthens his faith and the faith of others who hear him. He gave expression to it by writing it in this psalm that we are reading today, hundreds, thousands of years later, to get encouragement because we can relate to that experience. So very, very powerful and so very wonderful. And then he acknowledges that God's way is in holiness. God's way, which seems puzzling to him. Why is God not doing what I want him to do now? God's way is actually in holiness. That's what he means when he says, thy way is in the sanctuary. And uh, he says, you have done wonders, O God. You have declared your strength among people. He's now remembering what, uh, contrary to what he's experiencing, something that he knew, he understood, but he had lost, lost sight of in the heat of the moment or in the in the darkness of the storm. And then he goes on. Oh, well, actually, before he goes on, I want to I want to parallel this uh, with something else. He does go on in the in the in the psalm to declare that further. And if you read in the psalm, he talks about God's path and how he led Israel like a flock, you know, through Moses and Aaron. He he ends on a very high positive note that God is the shepherd, even though it might be darkness now. Uh, God leads the way. He trusts in that. He brought it to mind. He remembered it. And this is the thing when he talks about God's way being in holiness, the the difficulty and the trial exists because. We want God to operate and act in a certain way according to our expectations. And when he doesn't, we are disappointed. We feel like God is not answering as we want. This is the thing. This is difficult. Why is God not here in the way that I want him to be? And this is the reminder that Asaf alludes to that I want to uh, talk about from, uh, from Psalms, uh, sorry, from Isaiah chapter 55 talking about God's way in holiness. When it says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, or thy way is in holiness. God's ways are described here in this verse, in this famous verse. God says in verse 8 of Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That is why, brothers and sisters, God's way is in holiness. God sees all, God knows all, and he's reminding us, he's telling us, listen, just remember something. What you see from your perspective is very different to what I see. And as a result of that, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And as a result of that also, my ways are not your ways. I know what is needed in this circumstance. I'm keeping a close eye on what's going on. I know and I see. And I, my way is in holiness, in righteousness. God will do the right thing, the just thing in every circumstance. So if you feel abandoned, you feel forsaken, you feel God has, has left you all alone like a self, just remember, God says, listen, my ways are not your ways. You, uh, they're higher than the heavens. You know, I find it interesting because... Today, uh, you know, some of the rich people of the earth, they're, they're, they're having these uh, competitions. It's like the, the space race Olympics almost, where they're trying to race to space and build these rockets and machines. These private, they're just, they have a lot of money so they can do that type of stuff and get to space and do all kinds of stuff. And the interesting thing is it takes a lot of money, a lot of work, a lot of effort to engineer and, and build these rockets to get up into space. And some of them fail. Some of them, they land successfully and say, wow, that's, that's incredible. God says, as high is heaven above the earth. It takes man great effort to move from earth to heaven. Great expense, great effort. I want, you to, I want us to remember this because God is saying, my thoughts are so much higher than yours. You can't by effort and great you know, expenditure come to understand what I, what I see and how I see things. What I want you to do is to trust. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And my ways, therefore, are in holiness. I know what I am doing. So here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Remember how God led his people in the past. Remember, you are not alone. And just because God does not respond in the way that you want or expect in the moment, it doesn't mean he has forsaken you. doesn't mean he has abandoned you. That's a temptation of Satan. Recognize it, acknowledge it, and seek the solution to it. There is peace in the storm. Satan's greatest success is not to destroy us by the storm, but to destroy our faith. And in destroying our faith, he is essentially destroying us. He leaves us in, in panic and in fear and in trepidation and in doubt. And God, like Jesus, you know, spoke to the disciples. He says, have you forgotten that I am here? So God's ways are to be trusted. They are higher and greater than our ways and our thoughts. The other psalm I want to mention that is also very relevant is, of course, from the, the most common uh, contributor to the book of Psalms. And that is the, the King David, the sweet singer of Israel, who... Uh, 
who is who is dear to so many hearts because of how he expressed all these experiences that he went through and and we can relate to david in so many ways the particular psalm that uh, i want to i want to look at here and just pick highlights from as well i was reminded uh, of uh, recently uh, you know by a friend that it's a very relevant psalm uh, for for now for the end times and uh, when i went and reviewed it i thought Amen. That is, I was so encouraged. So I'm, I want to share the encouragement with you. Like I said, I want to express, not just remember, but say it out loud. And here it is. It's recorded in Psalm 37. Uh, let's look at some verses here from this beautiful Psalm of David. Psalm 37, verse 1. A Psalm of David. Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Does that sound like it's relevant for us today? Most definitely. Here is the trouble that David was facing. There were evildoers. And he says, listen, don't, don't, don't freak out. Don't fret. He says, don't fret thyself because of evildoers. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't lose hope and, and trust. Uh, don't lose focus and direction. Don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. Look what they're doing and we can't do anything to match or counteract. Look what they're accomplishing. Look what they're passing. Look what they're enforcing upon us. Don't fret. That's the promise. Very, very relevant. And then he says what their end will be. They will soon be cut down. This, this will pass. This will not be forever. The storm that the disciples passed through uh, was calmed as soon as Jesus got up and said, peace be still. They were going to the other side. That's the end, the end point. Whatever experience they had on the way there was going to pass. And it did. SF, same thing. He had an experience, some trouble, it passed. He recognized the, the problem. He, he remembered God's ways. He looked forward and expressed it. And, and he passed through the storm. He says, I trust in God's ways. God's ways truly are in holiness. I surrender to that. This is what David is talking about as well. Trust in the Lord. Do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily, thou shalt be fed. Trust in the Lord. Here is a key. You want peace in the storm? Don't keep looking at the storm. Trust in the Lord. David here spells it out so very clearly. Trusting in God. Now, I know that this many times is easier said than done. Well, trusting in God is based on remembering what God has said, what God has done, bringing that to mind. That's why remembering is so important. That encourages our trust. Forgetfulness is what many times causes our trust to diminish. Because trust is based on experience. Experience where we have seen God operate before with others and also experience where we, we have seen God operate in our lives personally. And that builds and encourages our trust. When we forget those experiences in the midst of the storm, because we're so dazzled by everything that's going on around us, our trust seeps out. And another way to express trust biblically is faith. Our faith seeps out. We're fearful. And Jesus says, why are you fearful? Where is your faith? Trust. This is what David is talking about in this particular psalm. Uh, now, not only does he, does he say trust, but he also says something else. Here is how else he puts it, uh, going on a little further in that psalm, verse 7 to 9. He says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Wow. You know, you read, the, you read these verses and think, wow, that's written specifically for our time. Whatever David was going through, we can relate to what David's going through because we see around us in the world something evil being passed. And, and, and David says here, the two, the two points from this passage is rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Resting and waiting. Now that's hard. Trusting is challenging. That's hard because we feel we need to do something. Now, waiting, resting, and trusting doesn't mean inactivity. That's the thing. It doesn't mean inactivity, but it means that whatever activity we carry out, we carry out fully trusting in God with confidence, not with panic, with fear, with anxiety. Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. And, and then you end up losing faith as a result and you lose trust. Trusting and waiting on the Lord and resting in him does not mean inactivity. It means moving forward in faith with his leading and guidance. And sometimes that will require waiting, literally, not rushing, not reacting. And this is what David is saying, because God reminded us, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Trust me. Wait on me. You see, brothers and sisters, what is going on around us today in the world? When it says here, the, 
the evil doers and men who bring wicked devices to pass. We're, we're witnessing that today around us in the world. There are men who are bringing wicked devices to pass. Okay, if, if you can read between the lines, if you understand Bible prophecy anyway, you know that there is uh, all kinds of stuff happening behind the scenes, and it's it's a it's a satanic plan. Okay, I'll say it plain and simple. I said it before, but I say it again. It's a satanic plan, and things are not what they appear to be in the surface. Uh, we know that there is a battle called the Great Controversy raging behind the scenes. And you can see that battle now playing in the, in the physical realm or, you know, in the apparent realm here with some of these things that are going on. And, and the, the hallmark of this battle, as far as Satan's concerned, his number one weapon, according to the book of Revelation, is deception. Okay? So things, in other words, in the last days especially, will not be as they appear. They will present as one thing, you know, uh, the servant of the Lord even tells us, Satan presents himself as a, as a benefactor of the race. Now, the Bible tells us Satan appears as an angel of light. He appears as one thing to the masses. But in reality, behind the scenes, it's another story. This is what's going on around us today, okay? plain and simple, biblically speaking. So David says here, don't, don't fret. Don't freak out because of that. God knows this. God sees this. And God has told us the end of the story beforehand. So yes, there is a storm. We recognize that. Okay, we acknowledge there is a storm. Let's not get so fixated with the storm that we lose sight of the solution. That we lose our trust and we lose our patience and we begin to fret. Beware of that. That's what a lot of people are fretting today. A lot of believers are fretting and getting seriously anxious. I confess, if I watch the news long enough, I start getting uh, fretting and getting anxious. Say, oh no, what's going on here? What's this? What are they planning? So this is this is a real thing, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is why we need to have this peace in the storm. This is how David reminds us. He says, "Don't fret yourself in any wise." And then he goes on. He doesn't stop there. Uh, let's go fat, too fast here. Verse 23 of the same Psalm, Psalm 37. He says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Remember that verse? We quote this verse a lot. Here it is. It's, it's from this particular Psalm. It's in this context. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You know what? That's what happened to the disciples in the boat. They fell as far as faith was concerned. They doubted. They feared. They were faithless. And what does Jesus say? He doesn't rebuke them and, and, and tell them off. No, he tells them, listen, he upholds them. He encourages them. He doesn't cast them off. So you're walking well and you feel the storm, this trouble is, 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 is causing you, you know, some uh, turmoil in your mind, in your experience, in your faith. And then you feel bad about that and you condemn yourself even more. God has not forsaken you as a result. Listen, he says the steps of a good man, they're ordered by the Lord. Though he fall. He is not utterly cast down. Then he goes on. Not only has the Lord upholding him with his hand. David says, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You know, we worry about the things of this life. How will I eat? How will I feed my family? What will happen to me? Uh, I have to comply. I have to follow this order. I have to do whatever. This is a lot of people now today. I know friends personally who are facing this prospect of losing their livelihood, their income, and uh, you know sustenance for their family because they're f being coerced and forced to take something or to do something that they do not agree with or they just do not want. They want to have the freedom of choice that God give, gave them, our God-given freedom of choice. And uh, it's a fearful thing. And here's this promise. David says, listen, I've been young, I'm old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. God's ways are higher than our ways. God says, listen, you gave your life to me, I'm in charge of you, I'm your father. Don't worry. I don't want you to worry about these things. I care for the birds. I care for the flowers. Aren't you of more value than all these things? I am your provider. I am your supplier. I've supplied you with eternal life in my son. How much more will I give you lesser things, things that are temporal of this world? Just trust in me. Don't get bamboozled by the storm. That's the promise David is, is, is relaying here. So trust in the Lord. You might falter in your faith and experience a little bit. Don't, don't give up. Just because you faltered, you, the Lord upholds you with his hand. Peace in the storm, brothers and sisters. This is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the peace in the storm, the peace that passes understanding. And then David goes on and he concludes the, the, the psalm with this, uh, with this verse here. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. That's the last highlight I want to pick from this psalm. The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. Their deliverance. And then he says this, this phrase that I really want to zero in on. He is their strength in the time of trouble. That's this time right now. Now, I'm not getting into the prophetic, uh, you know, uh, applications here in the time of trouble, when it begins and when it didn't begin. We are in a time of trouble now, and we know it's growing, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. But the thing is this, the Lord is the strength of his people 
in the time of trouble. His people don't go through that alone. Even though you might feel alone, even though it, it might feel like God is not answering your prayer, like God is not directing, like God is absent. You need him the most now and he's not doing what you want him or expect him to show you this or reveal that or direct you here. He's not stopping the storm as quick as you would like. And you're starting to fret. Don't worry. Don't fear. Don't lose that trust. Trust his timing. Trust his intervention. Keep asking, keep praying, don't lose hope. Keep looking to where the peace in the storm exists. That's in Christ. Christ within is the hope of glory. That's the promise of the scripture. So God does not abandon his people in the time of trouble. And, and we dealt with this in another study. Uh, even in the time of trouble, prophetically, after probation closes, God does not abandon his people. Here is David, he's saying, God is the strength of his people in the time of of trouble. We are in such a time right now, brothers and sisters. We are in a time of trouble. If you, if you don't realize it, all you have to do is look at the news, like, like I'm saying. And a lot of people are feeling that their time of trouble, that they never anticipated, they never expected, they were never told about. Nobody gave us a warning about this scenario. They feel like we're, we're out here on uncharted waters, so to speak. Don't freak out. Don't fret, like uh, SF said, uh, or like David said here in this song. Don't fret yourself because of evildoers and what they're planning, what they're cooking up, what, what, they're, what they're trying to you know, spring on us. Let me tell you something. Let me remind you of something. You already know this. Everybody knows this, but I want to remind you. God knows and sees everything that is going on. All the stuff that we don't see. And all the plans, the evil plans that we haven't seen yet that are still coming. God knows all of this. It has not caught God by surprise. He's seen it all. And he told, we know that because he told us how the story ends. He told us, listen, there's going to be trouble. He didn't spell out every single detail of the trouble. He says, just focus on me. This is how the story ends. This trouble, I will be with you in it. Don't you worry. Trust me, we will sail through. That's his promise. Now, it doesn't mean just sit back, relax, and, and, and be a, an idle spectator. No, we interact with the world we're in. It affects us, obviously. We need to exert an impact and an effect on the trouble and the trial by engaging, as, as the disciples did, in calling on the Lord. How did the disciples conquer the storm? They didn't fight with the storm. They went to Jesus. They called upon him in prayer, so to speak. And Jesus intervened in a supernatural way and calmed the storm. Are you seeing something here? This is such a vital lesson from our, our study today. This is how we interact with the world around us, brothers and sisters. This is how we interact with the storm. We don't fight the storm. We go to the one who can fight the storm and we call upon him in faith. Now the disciples called upon him in absolute panic, fear, and anguish. And guess what? He answered them. How much more if we can call on him in faith and in trust and in confidence and assurance? Say, Lord, this storm, you see what's going on. Please intervene on our behalf. God will do incredible things, greater than we can ask or think. This is how we can interact. You see, we don't fight the storm by using the weapons of the enemy. Uh, this is a whole other sermon altogether, but I, I, I'm giving you here a, 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 an insight, hopefully from the story that is very, very relevant, very practical for us. God sees, God knows everything that's going on and that is coming. Trust in him. Trust in the ultimate plan. He told us how this story ends. Now, Jesus said it to his disciples. And, uh, and this, is, this is our last verse before we recap here. The, Jesus said it to his disciples in this beautiful, beautiful verse in John 16. He was leaving his disciples, okay? Physically, he was leaving his disciples. And this is how he encouraged them. Verse 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is what I'm saying. Anything that's happening around us, God has, has foreseen it. Jesus knows what's happening beforehand. He says, listen, I know you will have trouble in the world. I know every single trouble. I know every single detail of every trouble that you might experience in this world. And, and the Bible tells us elsewhere that there is no temptation has taken you, but such is common to man. God will not tempt you above that you're able to bear. You will not experience trouble and trial above that you're able to bear if you recognize and understand that Christ, the one who conquered the world, is with you. That's the promise. And Jesus says, I'm telling you all of this beforehand. For one reason, as far as this verse is concerned, that in me, you might have peace. You know why? Because he knows when you face trouble and trial and, and, and circumstances that seem unexpected in the world, where it seems like God is not doing anything and is silent and things are evil is growing and growing and growing and encroaching upon us. We start thinking, we start losing doubt. We, lo we start panicking. We start fearing. We start losing peace. So Jesus says, listen, let me tell you beforehand. I'm speaking this to you. I'm telling you this. The words that I'm speaking to you are so that my peace can remain with you. You might have peace in me. So the foundation for peace here, according to Jesus, is the words that he spoke. That's interesting. And then he tells them, look, the, the, there will be trouble in the world. But remember, I've overcome the world. So be of good cheer. Here is how a Christian is to be, brothers and sisters, in the storm and tempest that is happening around us in this world. Believe it or not, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. 
Be of good courage. Be of good cheer. Be, be joyful. Be happy. Be trusting in the Lord. Don't be anxious. Don't be panicked. Don't be freaked out. Let me tell you something. What, what is life? What, what, you lose life. Okay, you lose your life. You know the Lord of life. What, what more do you want? But we lose sight of that. We, 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 we freak out. We panic because we want to preserve life. We want to maintain life. We want to prolong life. And I understand. And especially if we have others' dependents, we want to preserve their life. We provide for them. And all, the, all these circumstances and scenarios, they crowd in and they cause so much trouble. We lose peace. Don't lose peace. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Jesus' words are the foundation for that. And here's the thing with Jesus' words. I want to give you this, this, this quick formula. Read the words of Jesus. Read them. That's the words of the scriptures, the Bible. That's, that's, that's where our, our, our mind is to go to. Read them. Believe them. Repeat them. And share them. Okay? Read them. Believe them. Repeat them. Repeat them. Remember, don't forget them. Don't read them. And, and that's it. I read them in the morning and I don't know where they are now. Uh, midway through the day. Read them. Believe them. Repeat them. And share them. And finally, the last point I want to mention quickly here, and, and this is a, a practical aspect that I, I gain a lot of encouragement from, is uh, be of good cheer. Uh, the Bible elsewhere says, if any man is merry, let him sing. One way to express being of good cheer is to sing. So not only read them, believe them, uh, repeat them and share them, but sing them. Okay, sing them, sing them out loud. Sing the words of the scriptures, sing the praise and thanksgiving to God. Guess what? That's what the book of Psalms is. The book of Psalms is the experience of people who went through trouble, trial, doubt, questioning God, and they overcame and they made a song about it. They wrote a song. The people would sing that in the temple, in the sanctuary. They would sing these psalms of Asaph saying, Lord, where are you? I lost out, but I remembered and I trust and I wait on the Lord. That became a song of praise, a song of encouragement. They were of good cheer. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, be of good cheer. I've got this one. I've got it. Just remember that. I'm telling you beforehand, beforehand so you can remember that. So brothers and sisters, we're, we're going in this, in this uh, un unprecedented trial. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. This is a storm that Jesus has foreseen. He knows exactly what he needs to do, when to do it. He's just saying, trust me in all of that. Let me recap what we found today and we'll conclude. Peace in the storm. This is what we talked about, right? Remember, as Asaf said, bring to mind, remember what God said. Remember what God did in past experience through the scriptures in your own experience. Remember the words of Jesus. He said, I've spoken these things so that you might have peace. With remembering, exercise trust. Another word for trust here is faith. Okay, trust is faith. Trust means recognize, remember, you are not alone. Trust in God. Don't lose faith. Keep trusting. This is the point with trust. Uh, and then rest, as, as David said. Rest in God. Rest in him. It doesn't mean rest uh, as in no activity. No, it is resting as in don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't, don't just react with, with, with uh, absolute you know, fear. Rest. Act. Do what you need to do. But in a restive, calm, trusting attitude under God's leading and guidance. This is the difference we're talking about. Waiting. Waiting on the Lord. Don't let the storm dazzle you and cause you to, to uh, you know, jump and, and, and react quickly. Wait. Sometimes you will need to wait. Sometimes you, uh, part of resting is waiting. As in, don't, don't act immediately. Wait. God might open a door or an opportunity or a window that you don't see just yet. Don't jump the gun. Wait on the Lord. Don't give up just because nothing is happening immediately. And finally, call on the Lord, like the disciples said. Lord, save us. We perish. Call on God. Uh, and, and calling on God, I'm, I'm putting it here, uh, slash sing, because, you know, sometimes we say, you know, call out. If you need something, call out or sing out, as in call with a loud voice so I can hear you sing out. So I want to I want to express that, that calling to on the Lord, praying and asking for God's intervention also can happen by singing, literally sing to God, praise God, ask God to intervene in songs of praise and thanksgiving to exp express your faith and your cheer and your peace in the storm. And guess what? You will find that the peace of God indeed comes upon you and will give you that, that calm assurance that indeed, no matter what the world has, what the world throws at us, what's, what mandates they're passing, what's going on, you will be able to have that peace in the storm. So be of good cheer, brothers and sisters. We are not alone. And the question I want to leave you with, with what's going on around us here today, where is your faith? That's what we talked about. Where is your faith? Peace in the storm. Let's pray. We'll close together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you for the reminders in the scriptures, these, uh, these accounts, these incidents, the disciples, the story of Asaph, the story of David, 
and how we can relate to so many of these experiences because we also go through this trial because we also face the same enemy, same temptations, and we also have the same Savior. I just pray that you will indeed grant your spirits and, and this reminder may serve as an encouragement for each and every one of us that we might be of good cheer, that we might have the peace that passes understanding, that we might look on our hearts and, and indeed uh, grasp a hold of you in, in full assurance and trust and confidence to indeed show our faith, not our fear, not our trepidation. We thank you that all things are open and before you. We thank you that our life is in your hands and we thank you that you hold the future. And we thank you that we know because of what you have revealed, what the future holds. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. There is trouble, there's trial, there is a, there is a storm upon us, but Jesus is in the midst of the boat with us. Thank you so much for this promise. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. We ask this with praise and thanksgiving to your holy name. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.